hang out with us. I don't want to put that here. So, Hi, guys. Hi. Is everyone so having fun? Yeah. Happy Friday, Friday people. What was happening here? Is there like oh, a heart see. to heart that happens? There's a, gonna be. Oh, okay. I thought that was for Schmelke's panel. <laughs> it was, they were doing photography demonstrations. Seriously? No. Oh. <laughs> Alright. So, uh, <laughs> this, this next guest is, is very special because uh, it is her first Supernatural convention. Yeah. And something that I just found out backstage. It is her first convention period. Wow. She's never she's never been to one. She's never experienced this this crazy ride that we're all on. So go easy. I haven't even actually gotten to meet her yet. What? Well, because I was in my meeting. Oh, you were doing your thing. She's lovely. I've texted with her. That's true. Because we all, we all have these like massive text chains that are going before we get to the conventions with all sorts of surreptitious plans. Um, and she's pretty darn funny. Yeah, she's pretty great. I'll I'm say excited that. to meet her out here on stage in front of all of you for the first time. Uh, and, and to our knowledge, uh, I was talking to Shoshana about this, uh, it might be the first deaf guest we've ever had at a convention, at any convention that she knows of. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And uh, you remember the thing, right? They're, yeah, they're all set. So as always, we're going to take our cue from the band. Band, start us off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shoshana Stern. Questions on that side and that side. Oh, so there are people that they just come up. Okay, cool. Oh, good. Thank you. It's good to know. <laughs> Today. 
And I was working at this job in New York, and it made me question, again, about representation, right? Is it possible for me to ever show the world how I see myself, not how the world sees me? And working on that show, I started questioning that, the one in New York. So one day, I was walking to the subway, and it was cold. And I was asking myself if it could happen. And I didn't know. And then I got this email from Supernatural saying, do you want to be a character on the show? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> it was really a sign. And the character of Eileen is the closest to how I see myself that I've ever seen before, ever. And Eileen inspired me to create things on my own. And I started doing that because of my So yes, Supernatural definitely changed my life. Yeah. Uh, my second question is just, uh, are you enjoying your first convention experience so far? Yes! <laughs> you guys are great! I mean, I have serious stage fright, I have to say that. And I would never do this if it were just for myself. But because of you, you're so great, you're so supportive, and warm, and welcoming, and, and on social media. And, and I thought, gosh, you know, <laughs> I have to do this. And this really helps me face my fears, too. And I think that's something that you have to do with your life. You have to face what you're afraid of, and that will make you better. Because right now, my daughter's afraid of pooping and toilets. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I tend to tell her, it will make you better. <laughs> so, and do, so we'll do this con for me. <laughs> so thank you again for making me do this. Thanks. And yes. Oh, right, I'm doing it right, left, right, left, right. Okay, if I just screw up, let me know. Yes. You ready? Yes. Um, hi, so I was just wondering. Um, I heard that. <laughs> I, was just wondering, <laughs> um, I was just wondering if um, you had any problem when filming certain scenes, like um, fight scenes, there was like a lot going on, and if any like funny moments kind of came out of that. During the fight scenes, you mean? Uh, we'll the you're during the. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that too. <laughs> during the fight scenes, you mean? Yeah, like in um, Into the Mystic. That episode? Having an interpreter moment. Your microphone got caught in my hearing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Score. Okay. So, into the mystic, you said? Well, during the fights, uh, most of them are very well controlled. They have to be. It has to all be step by step because if it's out of control, people can get hurt. But when I actually, um, Jared's hand I was supposed to slash with that knife. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. They did it maybe 20 times. Because it was like, it had to be very specific. And you had to grip it a certain way so that the blood would spurt out. And I could grip it and the blood would go all over it. was wrong. Then I'd do another take and I'd spit it just like a little drip out. And we had to do it over and over. It was too fast, too slow. And I was like, over oh, and over and over again, and I don't think Jared liked having all that stuff on his hand. He tried to, get, <laughs> tried to get it off, and we had to repeat it, and finally at the last, I think it was the thing we were shooting last, it was the very end of the evening, and I felt like everybody's like, is she going to get this right? <laughs> and I was going, trying my best, trying to slash him, but anyway, we got it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And that's, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's my question, thank you. Okay. Yeah, they need like two chairs. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie. And um, another one. <laughs> I actually want to I've met you so far. I actually want to become an interpreter, which... That's amazing. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, cha uh, being a person in Super Ducky, having your character in Super Ducky, how is that different from being in Supernatural? <laughs> Super Ducky? You mean the film? Well, I think that Super Duffy is more of a cultural icon, and it's tough to translate. I think that there's a lot of cultural awareness, and there's a lot more weight to it, perhaps, than the average person would be aware of. And I think a lot of people do not know that nine out of 10 deaf people are born to families who do not know sign language. So often it takes a while for them to actually find out the child is deaf and then to say, oh, you're deaf, now what are we gonna do? There are options that you have to investigate. And during that time frame, often children don't have language on schedule with other kids. So in my community, we have, uh, have a lot of deaf people with language delays. And as a deaf person like me, you need to be bilingual. I'm fluent in English and I'm fluent in American Sign Language. And we have a range of people in our community, some who are more English dominant, some who are more sign language dominant, some who are bilingual and do both equally well. But if you can have both languages, then you're getting language on schedule. And that is kind of rare. So what Super Deafy represents is the spectrum within the deaf community, how you can be a hero if you come into a life with less. And if you do come into a life as different, like even at Starbucks, I have to say, I do this. And I show them the order on my phone. And sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's exhausting. And I wish that there was someone who would just be super deafy, come in and do it all for me. <laughs> right. So that's what super deafy is. A cultural icon that's really important in our community. There's humor there, but there's a lot of weight to it and a lot of strengths to it. And I think that I value the value that super deafy has within the community is uh, similar to the way the community cares a lot about supernatural. But the worlds that they represent are very different. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, you talked a bit before about the importance of authentic representation, and I was wondering how it feels to know that you now provide that for a lot of people. <laughs> well, I wish I could answer that. <laughs> I think it's still hard for me to grasp the scope. I think that being here today helps me realize that because the show's been on now for 13 seasons and I feel that my time on the show is so important to me, so precious to me, such a huge part of my life. And I feel that within the show, my time was brief. But the fact that I'm here now and that the, you, you people asked for me is something that I haven't often seen. And I often forget that. So I just think I'm humble. I'm humble. I'm honored. And I'm thankful. Hi. Um, I, I, just, I wanted to say you did a wonderful job portraying Ivy. I mean, she was a, such a sympathetic character, and I was so disappointed that she was just suddenly killed off so quickly. And I mean, because I think she had potential, and I wonder what you would have liked to have happened had I been mean, stayed on the show, like the potential storylines, or 
something like that. I don't know if it's just one storyline, but I thought she was an amazing character. I thought there was so much more that she could do. And that's why really it kind of scared me when I first heard that she might be a love interest. <laughs> because I know what happens <laughs> to love interests. <laughs> But when I was on Jericho, spoiler alert, I died. Okay. <laughs> so it was in season two. And the writers called me in and told me that they were going to kill off my character. And they said something really interesting. They said, as writers, we don't kill characters that we don't care about. We kill characters that make people feel something. So when I found out that Eileen, it was her time, I found out in uh, Trader Joe's, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, wow, in those two episodes, she made people feel something and feel enough for them to feel that it's okay, it's her time. So, if I got two episodes that made people feel that much, maybe that was more important than having her be on the show for 10 seasons. No. I mean, I wanted to be on the show for 10 seasons. <laughs> I think there's a lot that she could have done, yeah. But those two episodes were really a gift. And having her as a, as a character was a gift to me. And I think that sometimes when things end, it allows you to recognize it. And because you're actually, when you're actually in the moment, it's also sometimes hard to see. So I'm grateful for that too. Yeah. Anywhere in the world, in the whole world. You mean like this world? I can't go to the moon, or no, like you can go anywhere. I'm sorry. Did you say no? Can't go to the moon, or anywhere? <laughs> maybe Machu Picchu. Yeah, maybe. My husband's reading a book about that that my dad actually gave him, and you have to hike for like three days no, to get there. And that scares me. So I want to do it, because it scares me. <laughs> so maybe there. Where would you go? I don't know. <laughs> Machu Picchu. <laughs> I go to Switzerland. Oh, Switzerland, I've never been. Yeah. They have good chocolate. <laughs> Bring me back some. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I know a um, little ASAML. Um, uh -huh. My question is what discrimination have you seen in your life? What discrimination have I seen yeah. in my life? Do we have time? <laughs> well, I don't know if you had actually heard about this. What happened in Oklahoma City two days ago? A deaf man oh, yeah, yeah. had a stick in his hand. And I guess his father was suspected of a heroin. Not even the deaf man, but the police showed up at his house to question the father. And the deaf man was standing on his own porch with his stick. And I think even his back was to them. 
they shouted at him to drop the stick and drop the stick, and he's deaf, so he didn't hear them. And the neighbors were screaming to the police, he's deaf, he cannot hear you. But they shot him six times, and he died. That did not happen to me, but my brother was arrested and thrown off a plane. And my brother's also deaf. My whole family's deaf. Four generations of deaf people in my family. And the reason why he was thrown off the plane is because the, the seatbelt wouldn't buckle. And the stewardess thought that he should have buckled it first because he was deaf. And he wanted to wait until everyone else buckled their seatbelts. And he said he would wait and they would rescue him and throw him off the plane. So every time things like that happen, I feel like that could have been me. Because it could have. And I know that people have difficult jobs, and it's hard to make judgment calls during oppressive times, or, press, or pressured, stressed times. And I just think that if more people would educate themselves, if more people had dialogue like this, just listening to each other, then those things wouldn't happen. So it bothers me. It really does. And I think it should bother everyone. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I loved Eileen, and part of the reason me why... Me too. <laughs> And not just because she was such a great character, but because it's just so rare to see a disabled character that is played by a disabled actor, and that's so important. Um, and I guess I just want to know, have you, as an actor, had any challenges with going out for roles that are deaf characters and um, the, the people wanting to cast hearing actors to tell your stories? Well, yes, sure, definitely, definitely. But my personal experience when that happens, it's disappointing, of course, because it often happens because they say they need a name. But then how can any disabled person become a name if they can't get the role? They can't get through the door. So they have to let people in the room but I think that sometimes it's what's even harder is auditioning for a deaf character that was written through a specific kind of lens that has absolutely nothing to do with mine. And as a disabled person, for me, my life is not about loss of hearing. Not at all. My life is not about silence. Really, if you don't know what it sounds like, if you don't know what sound sounds like, then you don't think of it as silence. So often, they're showing deaf characters on the screen, and when they cut to the deaf characters, it's silence, the loss of sound. And I'm thinking in my head, my head is never quiet. <laughs> I mean, never, really. So, I think that that bothers me more. And I think that there should be more dialogue, I think there should be more collaboration, and to make characters more real, more rounded, more whole, more fully realized. And that's why I think what I love most about this experience was the opportunity to take anything you can get. If you have to work behind the scenes, go for it. If you have to work on the creative team, I've done that. And really, it just helps you understand how the whole world works. It helps you maybe, maybe, I'm thinking maybe people see actors, and so they have the most access to them, but they don't have access to what you can't see, right? So maybe you're attracted to the world of theater, but you think, that you can only see the actors, so that's what you have to be, and maybe you're meant for some other part of it. Maybe you're meant to work back behind the scenes. 
maybe. So if you get into the world, you can see so much because there's so much there. You'll be exposed to more and you'll see what you can connect to. So any opportunity you have to get in that world, just take it. Just take it. And it's so much easier with social media now. You know, before you actually had to have an agent, you had to audition, but no more. I mean, really, well, not so much, I'll say. <laughs> you can actually get in the room, especially with the theater. So just get out there and do it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Amy. Nice to meet you. Um, I. I was inspired to take an American Sign Language class after seeing the Spring Awakening production ASL. I was wondering if you ever got a chance to see it and what you thought of it. Represent, represent, I, I can't speak. Representing the deaf community, hard of hearing of the community with the voice actors, their voice. Well, I actually worked on that show. <laughs> I was worked on that production, yeah. I was an ASL master for the show, which means I was responsible for the sign language that you saw. And we began in a small workshop, and we, then we moved to a black box theater, and then we moved to a larger theater in LA called the Wallace, and then we moved to Broadway. So I was with the production the whole way through. And we cast a lot of signing parts for that. And I think that the play was just because I had a friend who did a show on Broadway previously. And I saw him in it, and I saw, it was a beautiful show, I loved the script, I loved the songs, I loved the story, but I remember, I told him afterwards, I said, I felt that it wasn't that visual. It was just very kind of bare. And so, I'm a visual person, and that's what I noticed about that show. However, with Spring Awakening, we added a visual layer on top of it, and I think it made the story so much better and clearer. And when that friend came to see our production, they said, oh yeah, now I finally get it. <laughs> I'd been in the show, but when they saw ours, because it was so intense. And we all are visual people, whether you're signing or not signing. So I think just adding the, the visual can be beneficial. Adding disabled people, adding representation is better for all of us. So I think that show really demonstrated that. That it's up to us to continue what that show did, right? Yeah, I agree. I saw the original production and the new production was way better and beautiful, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I also wanted to at least attempt to sign, but um, I'm not sure if it's very good. But I definitely just try. I definitely think that um, Eileen deserved better, and um, <laughs> and I, but I wanted to know that if she definitely did have to go, how would you rewrite rewrite her ending personally? I don't think that that ending was very good for her at all. <laughs> it wasn't fair. Well, that kind of show is sometimes right, you see. I don't know if I could have ever written a show like that. I would have liked, actually, to have that interaction with the boys I would have liked to have seen her go, go out and protect them. And I think that's why she went, because she was trying to protect the boys. And I think she felt that she had family first for the first time in her life. And we saw all that. All that was there with the letter and everything. But again, I'm a visual person, so Jared is, did such a beautiful job speaking that letter, I mean, I'm so <laughs> and I would never want to take that away from him. I just wish I could have seen it, 
you know? Have I mean do that, just visually? And then, that. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just want to say I loved you as Eileen. She was written as such a strong female character, and you portrayed her beautifully. Um, thank you. I don't actually have a question, but I wanted to thank you uh, and the writers, but especially you for opening all of our eyes. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I don't know anyone who is deaf. So I have never experienced anyone deaf firsthand. So I just wanted to thank you for opening our eyes. I'm getting emotional. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you're not the only one. <laughs> But I just wanted to thank you for opening our eyes to just show us that you're not handicapped. Deaf people aren't handicapped. <laughs> and we did a beautiful job, so thank you very much. Thank you. Needle in college right now because I'm not really good at acting and I love needle. So, what's your favorite part of being? Wait, how do you know? What? You said you're going to tech. Did you say you're not good at acting? No, I'm not good at acting. <laughs> but how do you know? I, I've taken acting classes. <laughs> <laughs> well, acting classes are bullshit. <laughs> oh my god, did I just say that? Oh, uh oh. oh. <laughs> Anyway, keep going. So what was your favorite part of, you know, being the backstage needle? Writing. I don't know if that counts. I think it counts. Writing, yeah. Yeah, and also, I enjoy working with the actors. And I did a lot of that for Spring Awakening, especially with the young actors. They were like 17 and 18 years old. And teaching them to unlearn what acting classes taught them. <laughs> and I'm serious, I'm serious. And I think that you have to be raw. I think in life, you have to be raw. You have to connect with yourself and sometimes connect with what you're afraid to do or afraid of knowledge about yourself. But that's what makes people respond to you. Whether you're dating or friendships or work environment or acting or whatever, you have to be honest. And you can't be thinking about how to seem like you can pass. Right? You know, how to come across. If you're thinking about how you could appear honest, then you're not going to be seen as honest. So I think a lot of that really helps people get through the bullshit and connect with themselves. So I love doing that with Spring Awakening. And they called me Mama <laughs> because of that. And that was great. I enjoyed that too. Hi. Um, Hi. I first wanted to thank you so, so much for coming today. It means a lot to a lot of people. Um, and I also wanted to say... It means a lot to me too. Though your time on the show was brief, as you said, it means just as much to all of us as it meant to you. Thank you. Um, so you're a big inspiration for a lot of people for so many different reasons. And I just wanted to know what some of your biggest inspirations were when you were younger and now. My sister, probably. Because she always knew what she wanted. She, well, I feel like, like my daughter, I, I look at my daughter right now. She is so pure, and she is so in touch with herself and in touch with her emotions. And I think that we all start in life that way. And then we learn that we're not supposed to do that, that we had to disconnect somehow from ourselves 
and we had to spend the rest of our lives then trying to get back to ourselves. And it's so weird. But with my sister, she was never like that. She was always connected and she knew exactly what she wanted all the way through. Always. And like with Eileen, my sister really helped me with that character because for like a while, I would wake up and I would feel heavy. I would feel like somebody died. And I would talk with her and I said, why do I feel like someone died? And she would say, because Eileen was real. And thank God for that. And I went, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she's very wise and very honest. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so I just wanted to first of all tell you how beautiful I think you are, and uh, thank you for coming. What? Here. What? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And uh, so I'm not actually sure if you're familiar with what happened in the end of season 12, um, but I was wondering if you think your character would have ended up working with the other hunters and maybe willing to sacrifice her life to help the Winchesters. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I think she would, definitely, I think she did, she did, she did it a little earlier, <laughs> but she would have, definitely. I think that before she met the Winchesters, she had thought of being, that being a hunter meant that she would have to be always alone, because that's how she was trained. But I think that meeting the Winchesters changed her life and changed her perspective on hunting. And I think that she was starting to open up and maybe explore the idea of teaming up, hunting as a team, and maybe get over her trust issues. <laughs> so, but I think that that's where she was going. Yeah, I agree, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, First, I want to thank you so much for being, not only just being you, but just being on the show, but because I actually have a cousin who is hard of hearing, so I just feel so grateful that the show that my cousin and I love so much finally has a role model for her, and it's like so moving for me to be able to have somebody on a show that is so important to so many different people to be able to have somebody who is different, who has, like, takes a disability and being able to make that their strength. And I really, really love you for that. Oh, stop! <laughs> so, Thank you. my question for you is, working on the set, how was it able, how were you able to rehearse the scene with Jared and Jensen and being able to um, like communicate with them through the like, dialogue and being able to actually like film a scene without having like being because you're part of hearing. Well I'm part of hearing, yes, but I do have problems understanding some people. And I think you have to have some kind of innate understanding, a sensitivity to know that you need a little more. I need a little more focus. I need people to actually look me in the eyes. And I think that both of them just had that. They had that inside them already, so it's very easy to work with them. I had an interpreter on set, and if the director would be way over on one side, the interpreter had to be sometimes in my side line, when I was working with the two of them, I sometimes didn't even need the interpreter because they're just great. And I talk a lot of shit with them sometimes, but <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> they are so great. And Jensen would cue me. He would literally cue me. Like, and just know what to do. He would just, both of them, both of them. And they're very special people. Thank you so much. <laughs> So this is the part of the convention 
convention newbie. Where we come out and we say, no, we just, we come out and we say that you did a fantastic job. And we say thank you very much. And we hope to see you at many more of these conventions. Me too. Thank you all so much. That was awesome. That was 